Holy God, our hope and our strength, by the power of your Spirit, prepare our hearts for the coming of your word so that we may see the glorious signs of your presence with us and your promise fulfilled. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We begin today with our New Testament reading, a most familiar passage from the Gospel of Mark, which opens with, a de with detailed attention to John the Baptist and the announcement of the one who is to come. So hear now the word of God from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and honey. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I've baptized you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Our Old Testament text, which John quotes, I'm sorry, which Mark quotes, <laughs> comes from the prophet Isaiah. On this second Sunday of Advent, we begin to turn our hearts and minds toward hopeful anticipation that is the promise of Scripture. The assurance that God's mercy is made evident in unexpected ways and in unanticipated places. That's where we're invited to cast our thoughts today. So hear now the word of God from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. A voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. For the Lord, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of the Lord will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might and his arms rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was in the second grade, we moved to Indiana. We lived in an apartment not too far from my elementary school. It was close enough for me to walk home from school 
no need to ride the bus. So my mother took me to the school and showed me how to exit the building, look carefully at my location and all the buildings around me, and walk in the direction of my apartment to make my way home. I understood the directions and was not at all worried about being able to carry them out to the letter when classes were over and it was time to go home. So when the 2.30 end of school bell rang, I gathered my books, left the building as I had been instructed, noticed all the apartment landmarks that I had been advised to look for, and happily made my way down the street. When I got two blocks down the street where I was supposed to turn to go to my apartment, the landmarks that I was to look for were not there. So I kept on walking. And the landmarks were not at the next block either, so I kept on walking. And at the next block, there were no more apartment buildings. I was walking now in a neighborhood of small houses with children playing in the front yards. And being new to town, I didn't recognize any of the ch children, and I certainly had no idea where I was, so I just kept walking in this unfamiliar and very scary place. This time, though, the tears were streaking down my cheeks. I was afraid, and I could barely see the cracks in the sidewalk as I made my way down yet another block, looking for my designated landmarks. Then a voice called out, Mama, that little girl is the new girl in my class. Why is she crying? I looked up, and a kind lady was making her way toward me. She asked my name. And in that breathless, crying kind of way, I told her I was supposed to walk home from school, but I couldn't find my way back to my apartment. She asked me if I knew my telephone number. Well, we were so new to town that I had not had time to memorize my new phone number. But I did know my father's name and our address. So the lady called information, got our home phone number, and called the apartment. Well, my mother, who had been out frantically driving all around the school trying to find me, had just gone back to the house, to the apartment, um, to see if by chance I had come home. And as she walked in the door, the phone rang. And the lady with me told my mother where I was and how to find her home. In about 15 minutes, I saw our big red and white Oldsmobile turn the corner, and it made its way toward me. My mother had arrived, and all my lost in the wilderness terror simply vanished. Now, the way home for me was flat and straight and sure. Every one of us has been lost in wilderness fear, in wilderness grief wilderness isolation, not knowing where we were going and wondering how we were to get through this barren place of not recognizing anything familiar that we could hold on to enough to get our bearings, of not being able to see the world clearly through the tears that simply would not stop overflowing. Every single one of us knows the loneliness of the barren, bleak, wilderness. Disasters make people numb and afraid and hopeless, writes Kathleen O'Connor. Disasters undermine our faith in God and in traditions, our normal that once uh, presented our world as orderly and secure. In the beginning of the 6th century BCE, Babylon invaded Judah, destroyed much of Jerusalem, interrupted the economy, and deported leading citizens to Babylon and occupied the land for 50 years. Into that barrenness for the Israelite people in decades after the, that evasion, invasion emerges this exquisite poetry of the anonymous prophet known as Second Isaiah. This poetry, this life-creating song, offered God's people comfort and hope and joy and healing in the midst of their exile. What words could be more welcome to a grieving people than the divine command to comfort 
comfort my people. Are those not the very words we want to hear today as we journey through the wilderness fears of our time? In our text today, unidentified voices obey this divine command to comfort God's beloved people. Unidentified voices call out instructions to be ready to prepare now for the king that is coming. Our text says, a voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The promise here in verse 5 is the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. The Jewish Publication Society translates this traditional Hebrew phrase with the richly resonant, the presence of the Lord, rather than the glory of the Lord, as we read in most of our translations. So the presence of the Lord shall be revealed to this battered, abandoned community in exile who believes God has left them in exile. The prophet declares that not only has God not abandoned them, Isaiah declares to them that God approaches on the very highway they are preparing. And how do they know that this promise is even reliable? Well, the text says, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This assurance of God's presence among them is reliable because God's word is reliable, because God said so, even in the midst and the depths of the wilderness, maybe especially in the fear and isolation of the wilderness, the presence of the Lord shall be revealed. Now let's think for a while about the wilderness. We have several references to the wilderness in both of our texts today. For ancient Israel, the wilderness was a place of freedom as well as political exile, a place of preparation as well as a place of temptation, a place of transformation as well as a place of testing. At times, the wilderness is a chosen place of rest and reflection, a welcome respite from the clamor of all that claims our allegiance and our attention, writes Don Wilhelm. At other times, the wilderness may come on us as an unexpected experience that arises when we move through transitional and life-changing events, such as leaving home, giving birth, losing a loved one, or committing ourselves to a new form of ministry. At other times, the wilderness is forced upon us and we feel as if we're in danger and face the trauma of displacement and such a devastating hurricane or a destructive wildfire or job loss in the midst of a pandemic. For many of us, the wilderness is experienced as a cruel reality imposed upon us from the outside. This voice that cries to us in our wilderness days is the very voice that calls us to remember whose we are. This voice calls us to remember that our journey of faith often takes us beyond the careful and beyond the comfortable boundaries that we have created for ourselves so that we may participate in God's transforming work among us. God's transforming work that God accomplishes in the wilderness. In the midst of all the vitriolic rhetoric of our day, we need to hear the prophet's words 
that God has not abandoned us in our wilderness. God has not left us to our own devices as we are isolated one from another. God has not discarded us to the pessimism of the airwaves. God has not forsaken us in this global pandemic nightmare. Not at all. Our scripture today pugnaciously announces a fierce and firm hope. There is divine presence, even in the wilderness. God does break into our world. God upends all our expectations when God breaks into our world. God appears in places of radical surprise, comforting all in trouble, smoothing the rough places, declaring hope beyond the limits of our days, gathering and caring for all of us who are wounded and broken. We are not without hope. No, hope and trust spring from the smallest of human acts, a friendly wave, a heartfelt greeting, a positive word, a gentle smile, a card in the mailbox. God greets us in the kindness we extend to one another, even in our wilderness days. God honors us not by erasing our wilderness times, but instead by being with us in and through these very experiences. It is no mistake that John the Baptist met people in the wilderness. It's no mistake that he called on the prophet to repent, which means to turn, to change one's mind, to change one's purpose. John told all of the people who decided to follow his voice out from the places of security and familiar into a place of discomfort and strangeness that, guess what? It was time for a new day. It was time to learn a new way and to reclaim God's way of being human together. It was time to get ready because the Lord was coming and things were about to change forever. John's message was to confess, receive forgiveness, turn, change your direction, change your purpose, be baptized into newness, get ready, prepare for the reign of God that is on the way, the presence of the Lord that is on the way. Have you been changed through your wilderness experience? I'm surely a changed person because of my wilderness journeys. How has God's Spirit been with you and led you to new life through your wilderness time? What is the new life God's Spirit is calling forth from our congregation in this part of our journey? What are the changes we as a congregation will need to make? What is the turning we need to do to follow God's call into the future. Crying out into the wilderness includes wrestling with deep questions. Frederick Beekner writes, to be commanded to love God at all, let alone love God in the wilderness, is like being commanded to be well when we're sick, to sing for joy when we're dying of thirst, to run when our legs are broken. But this is the first and great commandment nonetheless. Even in the wilderness, especially in the wilderness, we shall love God. How do we love God in the wilderness times of our lives? The wilderness is a liminal space, an in-between space where ordinary life is suspended, identity shifts, and new possibilities emerge. While the biblical witness is sometimes a place of danger, temptation, and chaos, it is also oftentimes a place of solitude, a place of nourishment, and maybe, most importantly, a place of revelation from God. Friends, God is in the wilderness times of our lives. God is with us as we confront who we are and who we are called to be. 
through their 40 years in the wilderness, the Israelites were nurtured by God. They were nourished by God and they were transformed by God into God's chosen people. As we travel through our transitional time today, how do we begin to see the new possibilities that lie ahead? Friends, be assured God is with us in our wilderness as individuals and as a congregation. And this time is surely a liminal time for us and for our congregation, though our time may feel unfamiliar and uncomfortable to us because we cannot be together, we cannot worship as we would like, we cannot gather together for our Sunday lunches or our small group dinners, and we can't even visit each other. We can be sure God is in this wilderness with us. God is among us. God is nourishing us. God is fashioning us, recreating even us in this wilderness time. Into the family of faith, God is calling us to be. To this God, who is present with God's people, our God who carries us in God's divine arms, just as the shepherd feeds and carries the lambs in his arms, even in the wilderness times of our lives. To this God, be all praise, honor, and glory. Amen.